Hi everyone! Today I'm going to go over the extra practice questions from the Functions 1 workshop um, and the solutions for those are already available on iLearn. They've got our regular solutions using loops and whatever we need to do uh, but what I'm going to do today is walk you through um, some recursive solutions for these questions. So a recursive function is a function that calls itself um, so often the return value isn't 1, 2 or 3, it'll be um, another function call. So I'll walk you through some of these uh, to explain how they work. But of course if you did it um, the regular solution way, that's totally fine. Um, just thought I'd introduce another way of doing things. Okay, um, so I've got my structure for each question. Whenever we are creating a function, it's going to have this structure. So what I find is helpful is just have that structure ready and then when I have a look at a question I see what the return type is, what inputs I need, whether it's a producer or a changer and once I know what my function needs to do I'll have a structure ready um, and then I can complete the method. So question seven uh, we need to define a function that when passed an integer um, say we name it num in the function header. Okay, so we already know we're passing an integer, so that's our parameter. Cool, and it returns the sum of the first num positive integers. We want to call that inside setup to test that out. So if we make it equal to 5, then it's 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5. Cool, um, so what should we call this? Um, I'm not sure, <laughs> what's a good word? Sum of, sum of positives. Actually, let's see, what, what do the answers call it? Sum, that's a bit better, let's just call it sum. And we'll be returning an integer because we're getting the sum of the, the first one to num um, numbers. So that's gonna return an int. So if we have a look at the solution here, what they've done um, is they've just created a variable called total, which they've made zero, and then they've looped through the numbers from one to n, um, in our case num, um, or perhaps we'll do n as well, just to keep it consistent. Um, and then for each iteration of the loop, it adds that value back to the total. Um, so that works fine, but we want to do this recursively. And when we are creating a recursive function, what we need to consider are our base cases um, and our recursive cases. So our base case is the case where we should stop calling another function um, and just return a value. So our base case in this case would be if we get, if we're passed in, if we call our function with the number one, then we should just return the number one because the sum from one to one is just one. So that would be considered our base case. We also need to consider what if someone passes in a negative five, we don't want that. Um, so maybe we wanna say if the number we get is negative, so if it's less than zero, we should return zero. Um, and we've said as well, if n is equal to one, then that should just be one. Um, and in every other case, say if it's sum of two, um, then we need to do two plus one. So if we get, get my whiteboard up. So we know that sum one is equal to one. We know that sum two is equal to one plus two, which will be three. So what we can say as well is that sum 2 is equal to sum 1 plus sum 2. So uh, what we need to do in this case is, um, oh sorry that's incorrect. 2 plus sum 1. If we have sum 3, we can rewrite that as 3 
plus sum 2. And we know that sum 2 is equal to sum 1 plus 2, so we can replace that there. So we can say sum 3 is equal to 3 plus, and then we'll replace sum 2 with sum 1 plus 2, because this is equal to this. And then we know what sum 1 is because we've got sum 1 up here, it's just 1. So again we can rewrite this as 3 plus 1 plus 2. So we can use those function calls because we know it will give us that result to work out our answer. So what we want to do here is return the current number plus sum n minus 1. So that might be a little bit confusing here. So if I do 6, that should be 6 plus 5 plus 4 plus 3 plus 2 plus 1. We're getting 21, um, which should be right. Oops, let's just double check. We're good. So let's trace this um, because that might not be immediately clear and that's fine. Um, so let's have a look at tracing this here. Okay, so what we are calling a function call is sum 6. We need to work out what uh, that returns. So sum 6, what will that return? We go into our function, n is equal to 6. We've got if n is less than 0, it's not true. If n is equal to 1, not true. Um, so we're here and we're returning n plus sum n minus 1. So n is currently 6. And then we've got plus sum n minus 1. So that will be sum 5. Um, so at this point here, sum 6 has returned something, but what we need is an int. We need an actual int whole number to return back, um, and we can only work out what that number is if we work out what sum 5 is. So that means that we have a recursive function call of sum 5. Um, so to work out what sum 6 returns, now we need to call this sum 5 function um, and work out what it returns. So now we're going back into this function, we've got n is equal to 5, and we go again. If n is, equal, if n is less than 0, well that's false. If n is equal to 1, false again. So sum 5 is returning n plus sum n minus 1. So it's returning 5 plus sum n minus 1, which is 4. Okay, so again, um, Sum 5 is returning 5 plus something. We don't know what sum is, so we have to go into this function call and work out what it returns. So again, we'll trace again. Um, we've got if n is less than 0, if n is equal to 1, uh, return n plus sum n minus 1. So we've got 4 plus sum 3 again. We're recursing again, so continue down here, and I'm just going to speed up this process because I think you guys, well, hopefully you're getting the idea here. It's very repetitive. Okay, so we've made a few more recursive calls, and now we're up to here, where we've got sum 1. So let's call this function sum 1, so n is 1. And we've got if n is less than 0, false. If n is equal to 1, return 1. So we finally returned an actual int number. So that means that we can stop recursing um, and we can work out what sum 6 actually returns. So to do that, we know that what we've worked out down here 
is that someone, if you have the function called someone, that will return one. So we can say this one is being returned back to this function call. So this is being put back up here. So I can replace this with the number one. And now I know that sum two returns two plus one, which we know is three. So sum two will return three. So that value goes back to our function call and sum two is equal to three. So we can replace this with three. And we can continue on with that until we get back to our original function call, uh, which is sum six. So we know sum three is returning three plus three, which is six. So sum three will be six. So now we've got sum four returns four plus six, which is 10. We've got sum five returns five plus 10, which is 15. And finally, by tracing that all the way back up, we finally have a return value for sum six, and we know that it is 21, which is what we got for our question, which is great. So a loop solution is, a fine solution. So if you did a loop solution, that's that's good. Um, but there is a recursive way of doing questions like these. And sometimes, um, especially with a lot of practice, the recursive solution is often an easier solution. Um, so let's try the other questions by using a recursive method. So question eight, we've got um, a function that went past two integers. So got two integers being passed um, and they say to name them x and n and x and int n which returns x to the power of n so we're doing um, powers here and the return type will be an integer returns x to the power of n um, great so if we did 2 to the power of 5 we get 32 0 to the power of 1 it's 1 easy. Okay, so um, if we want to do this recursively, we need to think of our base case again. So we know that if we had 5 to the power of 2, that's equal to 5 times 5. If we've got 3 to the power of 0, then that's 1. We've got 5 to the power of 3, that's five times five times five. So I would say that our base case is that if we give it a power of zero, then we should just return one. If we give it any other power, um, then we need to multiply our base one more time. So, I don't think this question is asking us to deal with negatives. You may assume that n is more than or equal to zero. So we can forget about um, our powers being negatives. That would make our question a little more complex. Um, and we can just focus on um, positive powers. So if n is equal to zero, then we know that we've got something to the power of one. So I can say if n is equal to zero, I want to return one. And in any other case, what we need to do is we need to multiply our base, which we've set as x, and we want to multiply that by a recursive function call with that same base number. So say if it's five, we want five times five a few more times, um, but we want it to be n minus one times. So let's just double check this works before we move on.
Great, okay, so that's working. So if we have a look here, in this case, I'm saying that power, let's just say pow, two, five, we've got x and n. So this is our function call. We need to see what that returns. So what does this return? If n is equal to zero, well, it's not, it's five, return one. Otherwise, return x times, and then we've got our recursive function call. So return x, which is 2, multiplied by a recursive function call, where x remains the same, and n is n minus 1. So now I've got 5 minus 1, which is 4. So we need to work out what this returns. So if we call this function here, if n is 0, no return x times, and then another recursive function call. So x is still 2. We're timesing by the power x remains the same, and then our n is n minus 1. So now that's equal to 3. And then what does this return? We'll find that this returns this. And you can keep tracing, but I'll just speed it up a bit. Speed us up to this point here. So now we've gotten, we've recursed a number of times, and now we're at the point where n is equal to zero. And we know our condition says, if n is equal to zero, return one. So we've hit our base case, we're stopping that recursion there and we want to bring our values back up the chain so we can get back to um, our initial function call. So what you'll find when you're tracing all of these back, the answer will be two times the return value of this, which is two times the return value of this, which is two times this, two times this, two times this, one. So you'll find if you'll bring all of that back up, we have a look at all of those twos, we've got two times two times two times two times two times one, which is two to the power of five, it's two times itself five times. We've got that times one at the end there, but that doesn't matter because um, anything times one is one. Okay, so when designing your recursive functions, you want to consider your base case. When should I stop going through um, this pattern of numbers, if we're dealing with numbers? Um, and then what's my recursive case? When should I, what should I do next? What's next in the pattern? Um, great, okay, question nine. Question nine, define a function that when pass two integers, we'll name them a and b, okay? So we've got two integers a and integer b. Return the greatest common divisor, so we'll call it gcd, and that will be an int. The greatest common divisor of two integers. You may assume that both a and b are more than zero. Um, great, okay, so they've got an example there. So the greatest common divisor of 40 and 24 is 8, so it's the highest number that goes into both of these. Um, so worst case scenario with these questions is that the greatest common divisor is 1, because then that means that there's no other number that goes into any of them, like in the case of 12 and 17. So that should be our base case, is that we return 1 if there's nothing in common between those numbers. Um, but first we want to check if there's a higher number. Um, and for people who are currently doing discrete maths one, um, you've probably had a look at these questions or maybe you're looking at them in future weeks. Um, but this is how you would solve this one recursively. They've got the answer here as well. If you want to compare it, um, 
but I'll show you the recursive way. Um, okay, so it'll be if a is equal to zero or b is equal to zero, return one. If a, so that's our base case. If the numbers are equal, then that means that a and b, they are the same. So that would be the greatest common divisor because they're the same number. The greatest common divisor of eight and eight is eight because it goes into both. So it doesn't matter which one ret return, it can be either. So that's another um, like final case as well. Um, and so if they aren't equal, then what we wanna do is find which number is the highest, take that higher number and minus away the smaller number with another recursive function call. So if a is greater than b, I want to return gcd a minus b b, and then else, we don't need an else because um, we're at the end anyway. Oh, I wrote return twice. Okay, let's double check that this works by calling it up here. So we already have an example here, the greatest common divisor of 40 and 24 is eight. So let's see if that works. Yep, cool. Um, and let's check another one. Got to do some testing. Okay, awesome, so this one works. So I'll show you how this one works. So say, let's do it with the example of 28 and 40, I think it was. Oh no, 24 and, 24 and 40. Is that the one? Yeah, 24 and 40. So we've got G, C, D. 24 and 40. Cool. Okay. A and B. Are either of them equal to zero? No. Um, are A and B equal? No. Is A greater than B? No. So this is what this returns. It returns A is the same, so A is still 24, but B is b minus a. So 40 minus 24, we get 16. Okay, what does this return? Are either of them equal to zero? No. Are they equal? No. Is a greater than b? Yes. So I want to return gcd. a is now a minus b, so 24 minus 16, and we get 8 and then B remains the same. Okay, so what does that return? We call the function again, is A equal to zero or B? No. Other numbers equal? No. Is A greater than B? No. So we're returning this. GCD, where A is the same, eight, and B is equal to B minus A, which is 16 minus eight, which is eight. And now when we call this function, we've got if a is equal to b, return a. So we finally hit a base case there. Um, and because there's no other like adding on each of these um, function calls, this value 8 just gets taken right back up to the top because it goes here, which goes here, which goes here. There's no other manipulation um, going on in this case. Okay. So that is the recursive one for GCD. Let's do question 10. Define, oh, I should do this. Okay. Define a function that when passed an integer. Um, okay, so pass an integer. Returns the number of digits in that number. So num digits. 
and that return type will be an int because we're returning the number of digits in a number. Um, cool, so this is a good one. Um, and we already have our base case. We have the number of digits in zero is zero. Cool. Um, the last digit, oh, so that's a little hint there. So we have our base case, we're saying if we're given zero, then we return zero because there's zero digits in zero. Um, and well, it doesn't say not to assume that it's positive. So I guess the first thing to do is to take, we need to check if it's a um, negative number and if it's a negative number, we want to turn it into a positive number because we don't care if it's positive or negative. Um, we're more focused on how many digits there are. So that doesn't affect it. So if it's less than zero, we should make it equal to We'll multiply it by negative one to make it a positive number. Um, and then what we need to do is we'll use this hint here, which is n divided by 10, and I'll show you what that is. So with integer arithmetic, we know that if we have two integers involved in an operation, uh, that the result will also be an integer. So if you do five divided by two, um, usually you would say that that's 2.5. But with integer arithmetic, that would be 2 because we always round down. Um, and because of that, we had a look at this question. I think it was question 3 in this week's workshop. Um, if you divide a number by 10, it is the same as just chopping off that last digit and removing it. Because we know that when we divide by 10, we move that invisible decimal place here. We move it one spot to the left and we get 4.7. Um, but we'll round down, so it just removes that remainder. Um, what we can also do is we can use modulus to grab that last digit. So that will give us 7. Because what we're saying is when I divide by 10, what's left over? And what's left over is this digit when we make that jump. So Using these two operations, divide by 10 and mod 10, we can grab that last digit um, and we can also remove the last digit. Um, so in this case, we don't care about what that last digit is. We don't need mod, um, but it's a good thing to keep in mind. All we need for this one is divide by 10. So, um, what we're doing is we're working out the number of digits in a number. Um, so if we don't fit this case here, if n isn't equal to zero, then we assume that it's any number from one to the biggest possible integer you can have. Um, so it definitely has at least one digit. So what we need to do is we need to plus one, one plus, and then do a recursive function call with that last digit removed. We go n divided by 10. So the next time we call this function, if our number is 256, when we call this function, we've said, okay, I found one digit at the end, it's six. So one plus the number of digits with 256 divided by 10, it's 25. And that will loop around again. What did I call it? I called it num digits one, two, three, four. So that should give us four in our console. Cool. So let's do a quick trace of that one. I'm just going to shorten it to num just to save time. So we've got num one, two, three, four where we said, what did we call it? We called it n. Let's move this back over again. So we've got this here. What does this return? Is n equal to zero? No. Is it less than zero? No. Return one plus num 
with n divided by 10. So 1, 2, 3, 4 divided by 10, we get 1, 2, 3. And now we need to work out what that returns. So now our n is 1, 2, 3 in this function call. So we're saying if n is equal to 0, no. Um, is it less than 0? No. So we're returning 1 plus num 12. What does num 12 return? That will return 1 plus num 1. What does that return? 1 plus num 1 divided by 10, we get 0. And we know in our first condition that if we've got 0, then we're returning 0. So if we do that process of taking this all the way back to our first function call, you'll find that what we get is 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 0. So we've got four ones there, so we'll get four as our answer. Cool. Um, and then 11 is similar to question 10, except instead of getting the number of digits, we're getting the sum of the digits. So I'm gonna be a bit lazy and copy that over, change it to some digits, and instead of returning one plus that, I wanna return that last digit, which we said before, you could get with n mod 10. So if I want some digits of, um, let's do one, two, seven, because that will give us 10. Oh, I've made a mistake here. Ah. One, two, seven. What mistake am I making? If n is equal to zero, return zero. n mod ten. Some digits. Seven plus two plus one is ten. So what have I done wrong? Perhaps this is a good time to use our debugger in practice with that. Okay, so we've got one, two, seven. When a step, is it less than zero? No, we're returning n mod 10. Oops. That's not looking good. If n is less than zero. So that should jump to 61 and that's returning n mod 10, which is seven plus this recursive function call, which is n divided by 10. So now it will be 12. So if we step, oh, it's stepping right back up here. How odd, what have I done? Oh, so silly. This is why you don't get lazy and <laughs> copy and paste. I'm not doing a recursive function, or I am doing a recursive function call, but I'm calling this one. I deserve that. I deserve that for being lazy. 10. There we go. <laughs> oh, goodness. It's always the silliest things, isn't it? That's okay. All right, cool. Um, so hopefully that makes sense there. We're doing the exact same thing, but we're returning the last digit plus the next recursive function call. Okay, great, question 12. Uh, to find a function that when past the floating point value returns the ceiling of that number. Um, 
Cool. So we don't need to do this one recursively. We can just do it regularly. Um, we know that we're being passed in a float because we want to get the ceiling of a float. But what we want to return is an int. So instead of rounding down, we want to round up. Um, call it ceiling. So what we want to do, um, well, the easiest way to do this um, would be to just round down and then plus the number one. So you can round down by casting that number as an int. So you can say n is a float, but ch please change it to an int value. Um, so that will do that. And then we want a plus one. So we've round down, but then we've added one so that it rounds back up. So if I get the ceiling of 12.3, we should get 13 there. Yeah. Um, but we're not considering negative numbers. Oh no, that's okay. It works with negative numbers. Cool, okay. Um, getting there, question 13. To find a function that when passed a floating point value returns the round off value of that number. Ah, so we actually did this in the practical this week. And again, this is not something that we need to do recursively. Um, so we're passing in a float and we're returning an int. So um, if that last digit is divis if that last, sorry, if that last digit is less than five, then we round down. If that digit is greater than five, then we round up. So first we want to get that last digit, which is n mod 10. And then we want to do a conditional. We say, if that last digit is less than five, return, or we want to round down in that case, so we can just convert the number to an int. Else, so if that last digit is five or above, um, then we still want to do that. We want to cast it down. Are we assuming that we just have one decimal place? To find a function of the past, floating point value returns the round off. As the integer closest to the floating point value. I just assumed that it would be one decimal place, but maybe it's not good to Ah, okay. Yeah, so we shouldn't be assuming that. That's a better way of doing it. Um, cool. So instead of using modulus, um, you just get the non-decimal part, which is int n. We don't want to change n. Um, and then, so say if I had, let's get this back up. If I've got n is equal to 15.23, then non-decimal will be equal to 15. And if we want the decimal part, then we would do n minus non-decimal. And that will give us the decimal portion. So that's definitely a better way of doing it. Cool. Um, and what we can say instead is if that decimal portion is less than 0 0.5, that's better. Then we return int n, otherwise we add 1. To round it up. So let's, oh, I didn't give it a name. So if I did uh, 
let's do five one. So that should round up to 155. Cool. And let's check one that won't. Let's do 49. That should go to 154. Awesome. So I've got that one working. And now the advanced question. So we've got define a function that when passed two integers returns true if there is any digit that is present in both the numbers and false otherwise. Ah, this is cool. Call the function inside setup. So this should return false because you've got no common digits. This should return true because nine is common. Very cool. So we can do this one recursively as well. We can do it recursively by slowly removing um, a digit from one of them. So um, our base case here mm, but how do we deal with zeros is what I'm wondering is zero considered a digit mm, how do they do it in the solution while a is not equal to zero as long as this digits left Okay, so we're ignoring zero. Okay, cool. All right, so um, let's get started with this one. Move that up the screen. Um, so what we are returning is true or false. So you know our return type is Boolean. Um, they've called it common digit present. So let's call it the same thing. And our parameters are two integer parameters, which we can call a and b. So um, our base case would be that one of them is zero. So there's no point checking it if one of them is zero. So if a or b is zero, then return false because I mean, zero and zero are common because they're the same, but we want to forget about zeros in this case. Um, okay, so what do we want to do? What we want to do is take a digit in A, so let's say nine, check if that digit matches any of the digits in B, and if it does, return true. Otherwise, we want to check um, the next digit in A, which is two. So we can combine loops and recursion with this one. So um, let's create a variable last digit a, and that will be a mod 10 because that gets our last digit. And then we want a loop. Um, and we need to keep a copy B somewhere because we don't want to destroy B. So I'll call temp B equal to B. And then I'll say while temp B is not equal to zero, I check if the Oh, I already have a variable for that. If the last digit in A is equal to the last digit in B, which we'll say is B mod 10. Well, if the last digit in A is equal to the last digit in B, that means we found a digit, so we can just return true. Otherwise, we want to check the next digit in B. Um, and our condition, sorry, our loop says while temp b is not equal to zero. So what we can do with temp b, so actually we need to call this temp b, um, is we can slowly remove digits from this temporary variable until it's equal to zero. Um, and then we can continue on again. So we can say temp b is divided by 10. Um, and we need to create a temporary variable for b because we need to use b um, later on for our recursive function call if it comes to that. So 
that's really important that we use a temporary one there. Um, so we can assume if we get to the end of this loop that temp b is now 0, and if that's the case, then what I want to do is do a recursive function call, and I want to do the same thing over and over again, compare the last digit in a with every single digit in b, but I've already checked 9, so I can get rid of 9. So I can do a divided by 10. So now I've got 172, and I'm checking it with b again. And we've kept b because we've only mutated it on a temporary variable. So we can keep looping through this until uh, we've chopped off every digit in a, which we'll do if we keep doing this recursive function call. Um, and eventually it will be zero and this will return false. So let's do some testing. We can test it with theirs because we know what it's going to return. So this should be false. And this should be true. So this isn't like exhaustive testing, but it does the job here. So should be false, false, should be true, true. Awesome, so that looks like it's working. Um, I guess we can do a quick trace here. Um, maybe with a smaller number might be easier. Um, which case should I do? I'm just going to change the name to foo because common digit present will take a while to write many times and perhaps I want to do it with um, 28 and 1, 2, 3. So this is A, this is B. Is A or B equal to 0? No. Um, last digit a is equal to a mod 10, so, or perhaps we're not returning anything yet, so let's remove this arrow, and let's keep track of our variables, so we've got last digit a, let's do ld is equal to 8, we've got temp b, is equal to b, while temp b is not equal to 0. If the last digit in a is equal to temp b mod 10, so is 8 equal to 3? No. So um, temp b is equal to temp b divided by 10. So now temp b is equal to 12. We loop around again. If last digit is equal to temp b mod 10, so is 8 equal to 2? No. So temp b is equal to temp b divided by 10. So now it's equal to 1. We loop around again. Is the last digit equal to the last digit here? No. So again we divide by 10 and in this case we've got 0 and so our loop is terminated. We're finished with our loop. So that means that we're making our recursive function call where a is equal to a divided by 10. So now we've got 2, 1, 2, 3. And we start again. So is a or b equal to 0? No. Um, so we get the last digit, which is a mod 10, which is just 2. And then we've got a temporary b variable. And we do that loop again. So as long as temp b is not equal to 0, is the last digit in a equal to the last digit in b? No. So we chop that digit off. We loop around again. Is the last digit in a equal to the last digit in b? Yes. So there's a common digit. Um, so that means that this condition is true. So we're returning true.
Cool. So those are some examples of how to create some recursive functions. Again, if you did them using similar solutions to these, using loops and conditions and things like that, that's totally fine. Um, lots of different ways to answer the same question. Um, but if you're interested in recursion, um, then it's definitely a good way of answering questions. Um, yeah, so maybe give it a try in some of your functions workshop questions this week. Just one last quick note um, about the advanced question. Um, another solution if you uh, don't want to do a loop is that you can create a second helper method, a second helper recursive method that just takes in um, a single digit from A, so that single last digit, um, and then another one B, and or perhaps a better way of doing it would be X and Y. Just to have variables of different names is probably a better way to go. Um, so instead of this loop, I can say um, if contains digit last digit a and b return true and that way you don't need that temporary b and that is actually a little bit neater um just complaining about not having a bracket So it's doing the exact same thing, except instead of that while loop, I call a function that um, just takes in that single digit, which we had as last digit, so eight, um, and then goes through B on its own recursively um, and checks whether that digit's present. And if it's present, then it will um, return true for this method here. Um, so if you want to have a look at that, screenshot that, maybe run it in debugger, trace it like this um, to understand that one further. We actually don't need that variable, make it even cleaner. Yeah, that's a lot better. Um, I, I would go with that solution over the loop one for the advanced one. Anyway, that's all from me.